and they put and the money they, into the business. And what they should be doing is closing the business. If well, they should be looking paid. at, yeah, exactly. They should be looking at the business from the point of view of the business has to stand on its own two feet. And if they are going to put money into the business, look at a way of structuring that so that they're protecting their home and other yeah. assets they've got and have other things outside of the business. Don't have if just you, the business. Yeah, mm. at this point, can I just say to people listening, if you don't know anyone like this and you don't think you can go and find someone in a, in a hurry, the, the two biggest concepts we've talked about so far are actually covered in the Rich Dad books. I mean, the first Rich Dad book talks about working on your business, not in it, and taking time out to do that. And I found it incredibly helpful. And the second book, The Rich Dad's, Dad's Guide to Investment, it talks about the biggest, most important investment in your life is into your own business. And the last third of the book talks about exactly the concepts that Greg's talking about here. I don't, I mean, you probably never even read the book because it's a bit dull. But... Um, it's, it talks about how the most important investment is your business and how you must detach yourself from your business and look at, look at it as an investor would rather than your baby, it being your baby. And, and it was incredibly powerful what Greg's saying here. Well, there's people I've spoken to who have got, they're in trouble, their business is in trouble. And I'm talking about in the last 15 years, there's been numerous yeah. people that I've tried to help because um, I want to help people because I understand where they are, how they got there yeah. and what they're going through. And yeah. it's a horrible place to be, isn't it? Um, yeah. And, you know, people say to me, well, you know, what do you think my business is worth? And I go, well, it's not worth anything. And then there's this silence. Yes. <laughs> and then they go through the emotional um, to and fro in a fraction of a second of that's really upset me. But hang on a second. I am here to listen to him. But that's really upset me. But I ran here to listen to him. And they, uh, you know, and it's like you can hear the little fuses going boo, boo, boo in their head. So why do they think their business is worth something and you know it isn't? Because they're in love with their business. Yeah. And they don't know how to value a business. And how do you value a business? How, you va or how anyone values a business is on track record, profitability and the asset base. So if you've been in business, and I'm not giving you a formula to value a business, I'm just giving you the fundamentals of how people look at it because um, businesses are all valued in different ways in different sectors, and I'm not in that business of valuing, valuing businesses. businesses. <laughs> Good God, no. Um, the last thing I would want to do right now is buy any business off of anybody because um, the worst time, in my opinion, to buy a business, unless you're obviously a massive, massive company. Um but so who what are, you do is you say, right, up business. yeah, who bring yeah. up businesses? Um, I'm talking about, you know, sub 10 million turnover, which is the small, tiny little businesses. But of course, we all think, you know, if I turn over a million pound next year, I'm a big, important business person. But actually, you're not. You don't even register on the scale. You know, you're a nobody. You're nothing. And no one's interested in you. I'm talking about from the corporate big, big player level. Um, all it is, if you're doing, if you're at that level of business, which is a fabulous level of business to be at, is if you're running your own business and you're turning over a million pounds a year, you're doing fabulously well for you and your income. And there's loads of ways that you can make more money out of your business um, with less hassle because you're, you're maneuverable, you're small, you're agile. Yeah. You can yeah. change your product range. You can change your audience. You can adapt your marketing. There's new loads you can ventures. introduce new product. There's lots of ways you can do. Yeah. But I'm talking about on the big corporate scale, you know, no one's going to buy a business turning over a million pounds unless it's some AI or revolutionary product. But we're all in love with our business. And of course, how it's valued is they take the turnover over the last two, three, four, five years. They take the profitability over the last two, three, four, five years. And they want to, they want to get, they, whatever they pay you for the business, they want to get back within the next two, three, four, five years. So if you're making a hundred thousand pounds a year every year without, you know, they're going to want to give you two to four hundred thousand pounds for that business. Um, tie you up in very complicated purchase agreement, um, which is the value of the prop the business is tied into what happens in the future. Because if they give you two hundred thousand pounds and next year you turn over ten grand, they've, you know, uh, at a bath, haven't they? So the, it's it's selling a business is awful. I've done it twice and it's terrible, terrible. I'll never do it again. 
Um, oh, but most people think their business is worth more than it is because they're in love with the business. I heard a really interesting factoid this week. I was listening to Ooh. James Sinclair on, on YouTube. I don't know if you know him. He's really good. I've he's heard of him. I yeah, think I've seen him. Yeah, he's he's very lively. Um, he was saying that he's done some analysis about all, all the businesses that, are, that employ people. And apparently, because... Because a lot of businesses own more than one business that employ people. So, for example, he's got about five different businesses that employ people. He says, if you boil it down, the the amount of businesses in this country that actually employ people is about, it's not that much. It's between 500 and 1,000 businesses that employ more than, I think it was more than 50 people it might have been. Mm. But the point, the, his point was that it takes so much to get to a point in a business where you em, actually employ people and create jobs. It's only a very, very tiny number of businesses in the country that do that. I thought that was really shocking. Oh, yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all, to be honest. It's all about being a lean, mean, money-making machine. It's all yeah. about streamlining everything down to, you know, it's like the guys I saw recently, these young lads. They're saying, well, you know, we think about getting offices. I said, well, you don't need to get offices. What do you need to get offices for? Because that's a <laughs> getting offices is an ego thing. Yeah. And 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 the it's so difficult because most people that want to be in business are egotistical. And I was one of the worst. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making excuses for my behaviour. Um, and of course, what you want is you want to be the big successful business. Come and see. Come and see my factories. Come and see my offices. Come and see my equipment. Look at my machinery. Look at my plant. And we've just bought this big machine. And aren't we clever? And it's not about that. It's maths. That's all it is. It's just maths. So it's about making your costs as low as possible, and your revenue as high as possible, and your margins as high as possible. And there comes a point. You get yeah, every business gets to an optimum level where if you increase your turnover, your gross profit will drop. The percentage of gross profit will drop. Now, the amount of money that you make might increase, but your gross profit level drops. And I can't watch it anymore, but uh, I haven't watched it for years. But Dragon's Den is a, is, a, is a good thing to watch. And actually listen to what the dragons say, why they're not interested in that business. Yeah. And why, why they are interested in that business. And they all, they no, most of the time, the dragons want to know turnover, gross profit, net profit, how long have you been around, how many products have you sold, um, and that, and because that's the starting point for assessing yeah, the business. They don't, even, they don't even get into all, all the other stuff, do they? Until they know the real basics, they cut, they cut that show so much. They people don't realise that the, you're actually in with the dragons for about it can be up to three to four hours going over the basics and then you talk about your vision and your mission and, and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, there's nothing new under the sun. That's the problem. And it's very, you know, everything that you're trying to do as a business person has been done before. Which is why it's such a good idea to try and find a mentor who initially the first mentor could be someone who's been, who's achieved what you want to do in the sector you want to do it. And then, when you've got the basics up and running, you can move on to someone who can give you a bigger picture and, and really help you grow the business. Yeah, I mean, if you can get, if you're starting in business and you're able to run that business alongside what you're doing now, that's great because you're not putting financial pressure on that new business. And if you can do it so that once the business gets to a point where it can replace the income you're making now, then you are already a success. Yeah. Because having a business that you earn in as much out of that you earn now doing whatever it is you're doing now, you can build from there. Greg, mm -hmm. if, if you don't hate what you're doing now, would you at that point recommend that you get someone else in to do what you're thinking of doing in the business so that you can stay the person who works on the business? And also it makes your business more attractive to buy, doesn't it? If, if it can be run by not not run by the founder yeah i think one of the uh, and again another massive advantage of the modern business environment is that outsourcing things virtual assistants people working part-time people working so many hours a week um the fact that people can work from home 
the fact that you can give people a task, you know, and I'm, I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to make something up right now on the spot. So you're selling these uh, pieces of artwork and somebody needs to operate a computer to print them out. So, all, you know, you can give people a turnaround time on the artwork and then somebody works for you part time. They get paid piecemeal for every bit of artwork they produce and ship. So it doesn't matter whether you sell 50 this week, two, 500. You've given your customer a time scale. They've paid up front. You've got your money. You're not going to not get paid. And you've got somebody else doing the legwork for you to produce that thing and send it out. So everything's so scalable nowadays without having the cost there all of the time if you don't sell anything. If you sort of, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so other, depending yeah. on your business, you know, which is one of the – sorry to cut across you. One of the disadvantages of a premises is that you have to be there. Um, yes. And I, I, I went to um, – it's a bit of a weird story, but I went to get some keys cut for a property and I was talking to the key cut guy in the key cut shop who's been there for, he's been there at least 30 years. And um, I walked in and he looked a bit, you know, depressed. And I said, you know, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, it's just dead. And of course, I didn't say this to him, but one of the problems he's got, he has to open that shop every day and be there all day. Or he doesn't get if any he's not, Well, even if he doesn't get any money. Yeah. People don't sit. People, I, mean, I often, a retail, oh, my God, I tried it and I hated it. But I did spend the time when I was in the shop doing marketing things to try and get more people into the shop. But I remember that terrible feeling of desperation, seeing people walking past outside and not coming in. It was just, a, so you've really got to think about, the marketing outside, how can you get the people walking past the footfall, as it's called, coming in? And then how can you market the business so that you don't have to depend on the people walking past? That's the really successful retail businesses now, the ones that also sell online. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, if I, I mean I'm, I'm trying to think of um, somebody who would go into business that would involve setting up a premises on the high street, I would say, yes, that's a good idea. I can't think of anything. Well, I can. I can think of all those shops that set, you know, the shops, the we saw you coming shops, where they buy a bunch of old took, they do it up a mm. bit and they put it, put it in the window and people come and buy it. But they could could also be selling it online on it on, um, you know, but you've on still Amazon. got to be there, haven't you? Well, you have, you have a few want people to be able to come into your shop, yes. So you've got to be there all day, every day. Oh, that drive me mad. Oh, I couldn't even begin to no. apprehend it. But the, and this is part. This is part of the beauty of the modern business world. Um, is that you don't, you know, I I would rather take the rent um, that I would pay for that shop, for the I saw you coming shop, and put that <laughs> money into marketing, yeah, online, and have a have a have a a really cheap basic warehouse somewhere, you know, and we're only open on. Fridays and Saturdays and if you want to come and look at anything you book an appointment yeah that's how I do it people are so scared to change the way that things are done I mean I I used to work in Gray's Antiques in in just in just the back of uh, South Milton Street and there's lots of little antique dealers in there and they they stood in there a lot um but they a lot of them did do this appointments only thing and a lot of them swiftly embraced the whole point of having a shop online as well but there's a lot of people who are so ingrained in the way things are done in our industry that they won't even consider changing their minds or, or offering something new or something different. Without going into any detail, I look at my attitude to business when I was 15. Yeah. And I look at my attitude when I was 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And I look at my attitude to business now. And there's so many ways to make money without Having a business, you know, you don't need to have a business depending on your situation. And even to the point of, um, I mean, I don't do it, but I would, I, I would presume that I could make some money doing something along the lines of some sort of consultancy I have in the past. But again, there's no premises, you know, there's no staff, there's no equipment, there's no plants, no machinery, there's no vehicles, no, no, no. 
And you've been um, through as well, haven't you? All the machinery and oh, equipment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Equipment. <laughs> and the thing is, is that it's all about how much money you're actually making at the end of the day, depending on what industry you're in and what you want to do. And don't get me wrong, if you're going into something and you're doing it as a vocation because you love it and you don't want to make money, well, that's what we call a hobby, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Paid hobby. So it, it's it's what I hate to see is I hate to see people jumping in with both feet. You know, they remortgage their house, invest some money into a business, when actually what they're doing is they're just putting money in the pockets of landlords and refurbishment people and staff that are sitting around doing nothing all day. Um, and it's, it's first, I call it. Yeah, and and it goes back to what I was saying at the start, which is you need to sit, step back, you know, from what you're doing. Look at the bigger picture. Look at what's going on in the world and how things are going to be influenced and how that's going to affect what you're trying to do. And, the you know, the, there was a guy talking to me recently, he's a barber, and he's asked my opinion on whether he should buy this shop that's around the corner from where he is now. And I gave him my opinion because <laughs> I know him quite well. And he went, <laughs> blimey. He said, so you don't think I should buy it then? I said, that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> um, because what he's, he's, in his mind, he's thinking to himself, if I buy that shop now, in another 15 years, I'll have paid for that shop and that'll be an asset. That's what he's thinking. Right. He obviously hasn't read but, the great taking then. No. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but it's too much for people, isn't it? Yeah. It's too much for people. You've got to – this is what, what I'm saying about educating yourself. Educate yourself a little bit at a time. Learn a bit. Learn a bit about this, a little bit about that. You know, go and research how the bond market works. And if you watch videos on how the bond market works, you'll find out how terrifying it is and how – and how, you know, when we print money, what that does. And and because everything's interlinked. So, under, for example, understanding the bond market will help you to understand why there's going to be a banking crisis. And if there's going to be a banking crisis, why that means there'll be a run on the banks. And why that means there'll be money printed. And why that means inflation. And why that could lead to hyper. So it, it's all linked together. And if you learn about one piece of it, then you start learning about the other bits that are connected. I re when I look back to the, I mean, I, I was so clueless about money and I went on this journey to learn how money worked. And I wrote my book and I mentored people and a lot of them did very well. And then it all came crashing down because I didn't know what was going on in the wild, wider world. And But I still, over the next few years, all I could concentrate on was getting a business up and running again and making, you know, making a living. And then suddenly, 2020, we, we started to look into what was happening medically. And then that uncovered a whole level of deeper understanding about what was really going on in the world of money beyond just how to run a business well and how to you know, how, how to survive in the world of business, it all became a lot bigger and a lot clearer about why it was so hard to, to make a business work. <laughs> and what what's coming in the next few years is really what I want to move on to now. Because we, we both know a lot of what I call, you know, ordinary businessmen, not that they're anyone who's in business is extraordinary, really. But people who don't know what's going on, if you had to give them three to five really important things they need to do now to to best prepare them for what, what might be coming, what would you say to them? What would you say to someone who owns a a bar, a restaurant, um, a, a retail establishment, a, a perhaps a service business that's employing five people? What would you tell these people right now? Stay tuned for part four of this exciting interview with Greg Porter and find out what he recommends in order to help your business survive over the next few years.